Conference, your source for JBM knowledge. Jose here to participate in Gritch, he said, would you like to do a keynote? Yeah, sure, why not? Uh, would you like to talk about frameworks? Yeah, why not? And that's the title. So I'm not going to jump like a steel bomber and say frameworks, 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 <laughs> but uh, the point of this, this keynote is to get you excited about the, uh, the different frameworks that we make use on our daily life, or perhaps those that you might want to make use on, on your daily life when uh, building solutions for your customers. So if I turn this on, maybe it works. Uh, my name is Andres Almeray. I am Mexican. I didn't travel so far away. I'm currently living in Switzerland. And uh, I work with a lot of open source projects. And uh, I love Groovy since uh, 2006. It's been a really, really pleasure to work with this particular language and be part of the community. And that's my boring slide. So here we are. This is our little blue planet. And uh, it's filled with lots and lots of software. And we make lots and lots of applications. Now, how many of you are already working with uh, some sort of microservices approach? OK, have you ever stopped wondering <coughs> what, why? why do microservices? Where are we right now? In order to understand why are we doing microservices today, we have to travel back in time to a moment when we didn't have these things. So we go very early in the days of Java. Uh, that's a bit too early. Actually, is this. You might remember uh, J2EE. For those that are very young, don't worry. These are the horror stories that some other uh, developers will tell you when you are, do not behave and, and write tests correctly. So there was a time where, by, by design by committee, uh, a bunch of companies decided to say, oh, this is how we should be building applications for the enterprise. And uh, for a while, it looks like it was OK, but uh, some things didn't work correctly. Uh, so there was a bit more of evolution. And eventually, we got into the granddaddy of all Java frameworks. It was not the first one. But it was certainly the most popular one. There might be some members in the audience that remember working with the struts. It was fun until it wasn't. <laughs> it was fun until we got the Ajax revolution yeah, around 2004, 2005, and then things just broke down. Because you might not, for those of you that are very young here, you might not believe this. But we used to refresh the browser every single time in order to figure out if the data was right. And you guys have progressive web applications and single play applications. This is easy. Back in the day, it was hard. And we had to use the struts. But the, the great thing about struts is that it taught us how to build frameworks, how to approach project problems in a different way, instead of just putting, putting code together and figure out if something works. So eventually, we got lots and lots of frameworks at a time where the Java space was known for having a new framework every single week. You remember this, right? And, and you know who else has this problem now? It's the JavaScript environment. They create a single project every single week or day. Well, that was Java back in the day. And it was fun. There were some projects that were um, focusing only on, on trying to, to get the, uh, the best behavior. And some others wanted to do crazy things like continuations, which are uh, still impossible to do, per se, in Java. In the, in the JVMs, you, uh, this framework was called Wicket. Uh, in my research, again. And well, life was OK, until we got this guy. Because what happened is that the creator, uh, David, uh, he saw that the Java space was very, very much enterprisey like and he wanted to do quick things. He wanted to do things in a better way, in a faster way, in a fun way. Because he wanted to, be, uh, to feel good when he was doing the work. So he simply took all the ideas from the Java space, put it in a box, and kicked it out. 
and said, I'm going to write a block, and as, as this is my application, and uh, the way that I write this, I will definitely will write some infrastructure code, and that infrastructure code eventually will become uh, a framework, and that framework was Rails. And it just spread that wildfire. Everybody was doing Rails. Everybody was learning Ruby, and uh, the Java community bled developers that were going into another platform. But uh, given that uh, the Ruby language was a dynamic language and provided a lot of features and uh, a lot of things that Java did not, uh, we also had a new language around that time, Groovy. And uh, it's thanks to Guillaume and Graham that we got this. Originally known as Groovy on Rails, but we are not allowed to call it like that. It's just Rails. It's the holy grails of frameworks. And uh, for a while, the life was good. Uh, we really, really have quick turnaround when creating features and going to production, uh, putting things into market, where compared with the alternatives. Remember, this time we still have Java EE, still named Java 2 EE. And uh, Spring MVC started to make some inroads, so Struts was still there. And uh, because it was so great to build applications like that, uh, a bunch of crazy people thought, what if we were able to write desktop applications in the same way. So we got Gryphon. The original version of Gryphon was actually a fork of the Grails code base, and we took everything that is nice about HTTP, not really, put it in a box, kick it out, and put Swing on it. And that's basically how Gryphon was born. But anyway, uh, regardless of, of what framework you choose, you needed a lot of computing power to run your applications. The idea was that you build this big application and then just put it on, the, on a big server. I mean, luckily, you might have access to a Cray machine like this one. Now, these things are not really that powerful. We have much more powerful computers. But uh, you have to have, uh, you, there were a lot of controls in, in the industry, in the organizations that we used to work so that we can do the deployments to these big uh, iron machines. And yeah, eventually the IT industry grew and every organization had had access to its own small data centers that look like this. And this is a nice view, actually. Uh, I will not show you a picture of where I used to work. And, but this is a problem, not necessarily because uh, it's a mess to figure out where are the connections, is that you have to have your own dedicated hardware, and you have to have your own dedicated people to work on the hardware and do the deployments and do the maintenance and everything, right? And this costs a lot of money. It's easy to think that because it's ours, it's on-premise, uh, that the, the costs are not that much, that just going to the outside, but that wasn't the case. So at some point, the industry uh, switched, and now we have access to big data centers. So instead of you or your organization keeping the cost of maintaining the hardware, it, you will just rent the hardware to some other company. And uh, they will give you access to computers and servers that are of different sizes, and you pay according to that and the use session. For a while, things were good. And then these companies that rented the hardware saw, mm, maybe there is a, a bigger opportunity here. What if we were able to give you everything that you need? Not just the, uh, the hardware, but we just give you the infrastructure, and we give you the middleware, and then we give you everything. You just just need to build the application itself, and we host everything for you. So we manage everything for you. And that became the cloud, which is where we are right now. now nowadays, it's difficult to talk about writing applications at scale without talking about the cloud. And the idea of the cloud is that you, as a producer, you want to reduce your risks. Because you don't want to uh, be responsible when hardware fails. You don't want to be responsible when network fails. You don't want to be responsible when uh, your application hits a limit and you need to scale horizontally to more machines or more nodes. Because if you were to be the one maintaining your hardware, 
you had to scramble immediately to do some buy to, to buy some stuff and try to connect it quickly, and then you figure out, oh, the spike is done, so we don't need that hardware, right? So that's the whole point of the cloud, reducing risk. And that definitely, of course, comes at a cost. Because we used to build applications like this, big monoliths. And can you fit a big monolith in the cloud? Well, yeah, but we have to wait for the time that it takes for deployment, isn't it? Because you're shipping a big, big ball of binaries and uh, do, the, uh, do the switch for the next version, it's going to take some time. And of course, it's going to take a lot of money in order to run this because, well, you have to figure out if you have enough memory, if you have enough disk space, enough computer power to run this particular monolith. Another thing that will happen if we distribute monoliths is the, uh, the downtime when we have to uh, roll a new update again because of the deployment size. It's, it's simply not maintainable when we're doing, uh, uh, we're doing monoliths on the cloud. So what's the answer? Do we stop doing monoliths? Do we shoot them down? Or we just simply break them into smaller pieces? And this is how microservices came to be. On one side, we have a big monolith that all the services are part of one single binary, and this is a big, big deployment unit. And on the other side, we have the same behavior, but it's disconnected with different working actors or services. And the idea is, is each one of these services or actors are deployed in a separate, separate unit. Notice that I'm saying unit. I'm not saying node. I'm not saying container. It's something that is separate from the other ones. We'll figure out how we can assemble this together. And this allows to, well, we have now to have bigger interaction or bigger communication within each one of these services. But if one of these goes down, we can replicate and we can, uh, we can have multiple copies of a particular service. We can scale very easily just by adding or removing <coughs> instances of a particular service. So this sounds nice in paper. But how do we actually get to do this? Well, it requires a little bit of dark magic. And when I say the unit, the thing is that in the past, this was the whole node, the whole server. Now, this could be a small piece of a single node. And how can we do this? Well, well that was not the button I wanted to click. Hold a second. There we go. We do this using containers. Because you can run the service on a single node if you want. So this will take the whole memory, CPU, everything, all the resources available on that node. Or you can partition the node in smaller pieces using containers, and you can run services on each one of these containers. Hopefully, you don't have any noisy neighbors, and the, limita the, the boundaries of each one of these containers are, are honored by each one of the tenants. Uh, well, that also works. But there are some issues that you have to take on. Uh, there are some considerations. It's, there's always going to be someone selling you the happy path. The, the grass is green on the other side. But I'm pretty sure that you, some of you have experienced the other side, right? And uh, this has to do with uh, the types of frameworks that we use, the, uh, the design choice that's what we make for the applications, and certainly the, the type of infrastructure that is provided by the particular cloud provider. So the things that we have to take care when uh, thinking about microservices is how much computer power do I need for this particular service? Because depending on that is how much you're going to pay. But also, how much memory is required for this service to run? Because if your framework and if your application requires a lot of memory, it's very memory hungry, you're going to pay definitely much, much more. And what about the latency? It's nice to say that we have a bunch of, of services talking to each other, but uh, because we don't know where exactly in the data center, in the cloud, these services are going to be deployed, uh, we have to think about their locality. If they are close together, it's likely that the communication will be fast. But if they are not, the communication will be slow, but how can we gonna tell? 
So we have to be very careful about that. Another thing that we have to be careful is when breaking down the monolith, uh, it's likely that you will find there is a module, the core module, that contains a lot of behavior. And this module has a lot of communications with other smaller services. So this, is a, this becomes, again, it's, it's another smaller monolith, if you will. And, and this one has, is your single point of failure. If possible, try to break it down to the smallest possible bits. Because otherwise, updating just that one module is going to cause a lot of trouble in the rest of your system. At the end, remember that what we want is to manage risk. And the way that we can manage risk is, is messing money on it. And if we make the wrong decisions, you may end up paying a lot for running this bunch of microservices at scale. And this is one of the hidden costs that happens because it's very easy for me or for someone else to say, use framework X or framework Y. Look, so quickly as a developer, you can write a program or a test and uh, look, I can put all these frameworks, just I mean, the, all these services on, on a bunch of containers and off you go. But how much are you paying for that when you go into production? How much memory do you need for each one of them? And then say, here you go. We don't tell you this, right? This is something that each one of you as a consumer has to figure it out. OK, so now let's look at some of the frameworks. Uh, right back, it's one of those frameworks that um, started as, it was also inspired by the Rails community. There is a framework called Sinatra that was a micro framework. It simply said, uh, Rails is nice, it brings a lot of features. What we want is a smaller piece that it only gives you the, 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 uh, the minimum capabilities. And you have, if you want something else, like a database access, or dependency injection, or messaging, you have to bring it on, because we are not going to give it to you. And Rapac gave you the same things. And at some point, the framework was reworked from a full Groovy code base into a Java core code base. We decorated with Groovy and a few other things, but the same idea was there. It only gives you the minimum capabilities, and you should be able to get started very quickly. Now, I'm going to make another aside here, is because thanks to Ratpack, the idea how they, they uh, reinvented the framework so that it had a Java core, we did the same thing for Gryphon, because, well, I would be doing a disservice if I didn't talk about Gryphon. Uh, we reworked the framework to be 100% Java. You can still Groovy if you want to, and, and so for those of you that are interested about Kotlin, yeah, you can do Kotlin as well. But it's all possible because, again, you have a tiny core of 100% Java underneath. It's likely that most of you are familiar with Spring Boot. The Spring Boot was born as a reaction to being able to break down monoliths into microservices, and it became the dominant force in the market very, very quickly. Almost everybody has seen a Spring Boot in one way or another. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, Grails, was, Grails 3 was based on a Spring Boot. And uh, that worked also for a while. And it's very, very easy to create applications with a Spring Boot. As a developer, the developer experience that you get is fine, is fun, is quick if you know where to find the documentation and if you know how to follow the tutorials. But when we turn into deployment, things become different. If, you, if this is a medium-sized application, so your regular monolith, no problems. But if you want to deploy a bunch of microservices, then you're going to see some problems, which is uh, deployment size and startup time. Uh, there is another alternative, Micro Profile. Micro Profile is still part of the Java EE space, but the idea is that Java EE is still very, very large. It's still de in designed in a way to create monolithic applications. So the idea behind Micro Profile is to take those standards from the JSRs, from the JCP, 
and create something that allows you to define and build microservices. It started with just an, a bunch of, of uh, JSRs, just I think it was around uh, five or six, and now the latest version contains more than 20. So it's growing very, very quickly. But the advantage of MicroProfile is that it's still part of standards, and it's now developed in the open. In, in a much faster way than it was in the past with Java EE. So if you are still re in somehow uh, related to uh, JSRs and you want to do things in the standard Java way, the micro profile is an option for you. Here's a funny um, slide. This was presented by Oracle when they announced Project Helidon. Project Helidon is their answer, is Oracle's answer to uh, writing microservices. Uh, funny thing is that they claim that a Spring Boot is full stack, it's big, whereas at the bottom we have the really tiny micro frameworks, and we finally see the appearance of Micronaut right there. And uh, they claim that Helidon is able to work with these much smaller frameworks. This more like a uh, like common APIs that can be integrated with each one of us. Now, personally, I don't have any experience working with Project Helidon. It looks nice, it sounds nice. Uh, we'll see if it actually goes into a place where more people make use of Helidon. And uh, Open Liberty, for those of you that ever had to work with Westphia, do not fear. This is the open version, and uh, supposedly it's, it's leaner and meaner. I also have not made use of this particular one because if I want to do something on the web, it's either the big fat Spring Boot or the lean and mean Micronaut. Java Lean and Apache Spark. No, actually, this is Java Spark. This is not Apache Spark. This, this is a very common mistake. Apache Spark is for Hadoop, and uh, Java Spark has nothing to do with that. And uh, originally, Spark was first. This is very similar to Rat Pack. It only gives you the router, the capabilities to launch a web, a web application. But if you need a database or any other kind of connectivity or, or dependency injection, anything else that you consider a regular web framework should give you, you, should, you must bring it on your own. It's just the same thing as Rat Pack. And Javelin is a re-implementation of Java Spark, but taking into account compatibility with the Kotlin language. As a matter of fact, they prefer if you were to write Kotlin with Javelin, but because it has, like Ratpack and Gryphon, a tiny Java core, you can write applications also in Java. There's nothing stopping you to use Groovy with Javelin if you want to. It's just that the authors prefer Java and Kotlin. And then, of course, we got this big guy, which is actually tiny, announced last year, Micronaut. What is interesting about Micronaut is that uh, when it was announced, uh, we knew that because it was coming from the, the same team that gave us Grails, it would be very powerful. It would be very interesting. But it had a really tall order, compete against Spring Boot, the giant in the market. A year ago, I would have said uh, that was a bold move. One year after, I can say that Micronaut made all the right choices. And is definitely making, the, uh, making sure that the market is aware of what are the trends and what are the things that we as developers should consider. Because before Micronaut, people didn't care too much about deployment size. They didn't care too much about the start on time because they were still trying to run monoliths or smaller monoliths in the cloud. But with this, you can run hundreds and thousands of services very quickly and make sure that your production is reacting as soon as possible. Because when you take 20 seconds to, once you have deployed, but 20 seconds to boot up and serve in the first request, Micronaut has already spent 19 seconds serving all requests if not more, uh, more than that. So it is a really a game changer. And it's such a game changer that 
all the companies and other organizations are taking note, and we just recently got the news of Quarkus, which is coming from Red Hat. And they have similar ideas. They want to provide the smallest possible set of features and uh, deployment size and memory footprint for you to deploy into a microservice oriented architecture. But it also, they will give you the capability to start as fast as possible, given certain constraints. So there is no free lunch. You have to take some considerations here when you want to be as fast. They do this through the current grails in the Java space. The holy grail of being fast in Java is GraalVM. There are three things in the Graal project. One thing is the JIT compiler. The other thing is Substrate VM, which is what allows you to run multiple languages in the say JVM. And finally, we have the Graal AOT, ahead of, of, um, as, what? ahead of time compiler. This is the thing that makes things very, very fast, because it will make your Java code be compiled into native code, into native, native images. So it will be fast as native code. But in order to do this, you have to relinquish all the magic that you are used to. So reflection is a no-no. There is a way around it, but it's painful. And uh, your libraries, all the code that you're used to use with, uh, with the Spring Boot and, and Grails and everything else, they have to be adapted so that they work correctly with their restrictions coming from GraalVM. And this is exactly what the Quarkus team is doing. It allows you to run uh, Hibernate, JPA, and that's some form, restricted form of dependency injection uh, with Quarkus, which is another great thing that uh, Micronaut did. Instead of using runtime dependency injection, they decided to move everything to compile time. So they can resolve all the dependencies, all everything that you have to do uh, usually at runtime. Now you do it on compile time. You can figure out that if, if the injections are going to work or not, so you don't get any runtime exceptions because something is missing or is the wrong type. And because all that thing is already done when you compile, when you start the application, it's just much faster. There's less things that the framework has to do during bottom. It's the same thing that Quarkus does. It allows you to find a lot of information about your application, so assemble everything before it has to be run. Now, this is fine where we're working in the Java space. And we're doing all of this because uh, we have a serious competitor at the other side of the aisle. And it is this guy. Go. If you are really serious about being the fastest in production, being the, uh, the leanest and the smallest running on the cloud, reacting as soon as you can, Go is the only game in town. This is the one that is leading the charge. You may dislike the syntax all, you, all, you, all the time you want. It doesn't matter. You may dislike the fact that exceptions work differently in Go. It doesn't matter. This thing is so fast that you cannot even measure it. But Micronaut is getting very close to getting us the same behavior, uh, well, not the same behavior, but the same gains as running Go. So keep an eye on Micronaut, but certainly keep an eye on Go because it's leading the charge. All right. But when building microservices, we have to take on other challenges. Because when is it just a, a, um, a single monolith? Well, we can have all the services in one place. It's easy to reason about when things are all in one location. But when now we put a lot of agents and instances talking to each other at different times, going up, going down, with multiple copies, different versions, maybe incompatible versions with one another. How do we make this all happen? It just, boom, explodes and go crazy. So one of the things that we have to take on is that once you have deployed a bunch of, of instances is monitoring. I thought that was funny. <laughs> 
Uh, especially in Spanish, how we pronounce this thing. Anyway, uh, monitoring your services becomes much, much important. Because you have to know if the service is alive, is it the right version? If it's responding correctly, is it giving you the, uh, the responses at the right time with the right um, response time? Or is it less than that? Is it more than that? All these things you have to know. What is the current state of these things? And uh, it was easy in the monolith. Now it's much more complicated because how many instances are you running? You also have to do tracing. If you want to know where and when a request is being processed on your system, then you have to apply different techniques. There is a bunch of frameworks out there and other libraries on the Java space and on the Go space as well that will help you do this. So a request enters the system and connects to, I don't know, 20 microservices and hits a bunch of databases and then comes back and gives you an order then you have to know exactly all the places where this thing is going. And tracing, there are many ways to do this, will let you know exactly what happened. Another thing that will happen is federation, where you want to run all your services together and uh, turn them down, turn them up. It's something that we didn't have to think about in mon monoliths, but now it's something that it has to be on your mind. And the path to success, we can make this happen. Other big companies have done it. Smaller companies have done it as well. So we can do it as well. You just have to be sure that you select the right framework. Maybe Micronaut is the right one. Maybe Springwood continues to be the right one for you, depending on, on your uh, organization itself or your team dynamics or of the, uh, the type of uh, experience and expertise that the team has. But we cannot do this alone. We have to do it as part of a team. And what better part of a team is out there than open source? So all of you have benefited in one way or another from open source. And some of you have contributed to open source. And you know that contributing to open source, or you, or you think that contributing to open source looks like this. It's a big party. Everybody's having fun. Everybody is like, yes, we should do this. This is the great thing ever. And I can talk to everybody. And this just works perfectly well, right? Well, no. This is actually how we develop open source most of the time. In the wee hours of the night, trying to fix a bug uh, from a user that is coming at the other side of the, uh, the world that we never met but he is very eager to use our software, so that's why we uh, step in those hours in the night trying to fix it. And also because it's fun. We're working on our own projects. We're working on our code. We, we like to solve challenges. But you know what? After some time of doing this every single night or after so many years, this is how we feel. It's not so fun anymore. It's, it's entertaining for those that consume open source, but deep inside us is like, ah, oh, I really wish I would like to, to continue to work on this, but I have to make ends meet. And uh, either I do my own daily work, or I do open source. And those of you that are fortunate enough to be paid to do open source, uh, you may not feel like this, but eventually you might feel like this. So how can we avoid this? It's easy. All of us can do this. We just have to change. How do we change? Well, first thing you do is let know at the other people of the other side of the wire that you're using the project, that you find it useful, or that you found a problem, or you know what, that you didn't like it. Now, don't be mean, but if, if you want to, to criticize one of these projects, try to give some constructive uh, criticism. Why you didn't like it? Why do you think this is better than the other? Or maybe how this thing could be improved. It, it just works. You can use many ways. You can talk in person if you find that, that particular person. Send in an email. Or if you know the person, uh, or send in a, uh, talk to, to the phone. There are so many ways. We are so connected right now that it's easy to reach out. And 
don't worry about the language barriers too much. Uh, my, my mother tongue is Spanish, but I'm here uh, talking to you in English, and there I can see other members in the audience that come from, ma from many different places and are very far away. It doesn't matter if your command on the English language is not that good. Don't worry. The person at the other side will be able to understand you. Engage in a conversation. This is the easiest way. You find something, you find a problem, you find a bug, file a ticket. That's it. If you have the time and you have the skills and you want to do it and you have the passion, you can submit a test case. You can even submit a patch, but at the very least, uh, create an issue so that people at the other side know what's going on. And now, again, talking about microservices, there are so many different frameworks and libraries that we have to make use in order to be effective with what we do. That it's very likely that you're going to encounter a bug much faster than in the past. So if you can, fix the bug. If not, it's OK. So remember, open source is, I believe, is the way to go. We can mix and match with commercial sources as well. Uh, all the frameworks that we saw today, uh, or that were mentioned today, are open source. Most of the libraries that you use for monitoring and tracing and the databases and everything else that you do in microservices are mostly open source as well. There will be some commercial offerings that attach to each one of these libraries that will give you some sort of support or additional features that you have to pay for. Just evaluate if it makes sense for you and your organization to do so. I mean, there is a reason why these offerings exist. And uh, it's just up to you to define if it's actually worthwhile for your case. So I'm not going to say use Project X or pro use Project Y. You should talk to that organization or the other, buy this thing. You have to make your own mind. So I, f I think, I hope you found s some of the things that I talked today useful. My idea for this keynote was to make it a little bit more inspirational, so let you know what is the landscape of the different frameworks? So doing microservices is not just a Spring Boot, and it's not just Micronaut. It may be a combination of both, or something else. The thing is that we have to figure out why are we doing things that we're doing it today. Because if we don't remember the past, then we cannot plan for the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>